Okay guys, so this is the moment I've been waiting for for quite a while now. Today is day one on my new house build. This is the raw land here that I'm going to be building on. So I'll take you for a little walk around here. There is the swimming pond that I'm going to be addressing soon. There's the garden and there's the jet ski pond. So the house is going to go right here. There's a stake right there, you can see. That's going to be this corner. It's going to go from here that way, from there down that way. It's going to have a walkout basement. So this is the house that's currently here right now. We're going to do a bit of a renovation to that. No, I'm just kidding. We're taking that right out. That's something I built like four years ago and I just used half inch sawmill lumber for siding and for the roof, I did the same thing. Unfortunately, I used ring shank nails, so I'm not gonna be able to disassemble it easily. So I'll probably just have to cut it apart and take it out of here. So let's talk about the new house that's gonna go in the place of that one. So I'm gonna be building an ICF house. And when I say it's an ICF house, I mean it's a real ICF house. I'm not talking about these hybrid houses that have ICF walls and then and then they frame the roof on top of it and they frame the floors out of wood. I'm talking everything on this house is concrete. The floors, the roof, the walls, the basement, obviously, everything is concrete. So, there's a lot of details to go over here. And I got these set of plans made up without all the engineer's information here. So I can share this freely with you guys. So what I'm going to do is have a story and a half and I'm going to have a gable dormer on the front and I'm going to have a shed dormer on the back and there's not really a great picture on here that illustrates exactly what it's going to look like. This kind of does, but this is the shed roof off the back and the gable dormer isn't really shown here. So before I start clearing this land, let me take you back and tell you how I got to this point, give you a little history and share a little about where I'm going with this. This is the front of the house. This is the mud room right here with a full basement underneath for a utility room. Then I have my gable dormer on the front with some triangle windows and so on the back here's the shed dormer and I got some cool picture windows that's gonna be my bedroom there and we have a lot to cover here so I'll just try to cover the basics because there's a lot of details in this house um, so here's my back door here is the walkout part of the basement it's kinda like a chamber and so yeah I like this I like this roof design that's something I've always wanted I'm gonna have about 18 inches of overhang on the gable ends and the eave ends so let's take some layers off now and I'll show you the first floor So, all right, so basically it's it's pretty basic on the first floor. You walk in here. It's a little bit different than I have it here. I kind of made some changes here. So this, this opening for the downstairs will be a little bit bigger than that. So you basically you can walk in. There's going to be a door here for, to go down to the basement. And then you go around here. There's a landing. You go upstairs. Basically, the first floor is going to be all open, open concept. There's a refrigerator, there's the island, there's the countertops. This is the back door. And I'm going to probably have just like a small little deck right here over top of this chamber made out of concrete. Just for now, I'll probably do a, a whole deck on the back later, but for right now, I'm, I'm really on a tight budget here. So I don't get all the luxuries that I'd like. But basically, you know, small living room with open concept. So everything's just open. There's no beams. There's no walls except for the stairs. That's it. So that's the first floor. 
So let's go to the second floor. So on the second floor, basically you come up the stairs and there's this little hallway here. And I'll have my washing machine and dryer because nobody wants to bring laundry to and from the basement anymore. I don't know why anybody would ever do that. Put your laundry on the same level that you are going to be using the laundry. So you don't have to go up and down stairs with it. That is ridiculous. So anyways, here's my bathroom upstairs. And here is one bedroom for my son Caden. It's 12 by 12. And then this whole thing is going to be the master bedroom right here. So, we're going to have some cool picture windows there. So eventually I'm going to put a door right here. And I'm going to make this into another little bedroom over here. And that'll be the third bedroom. But for right now, I'm trying to do this on a budget. And with taxes and the septic system and all that kind of stuff, I'm just going to do two bedrooms for now. So I know you guys probably have a lot of questions about this house. I'm going to try to explain as many details as I can along the way. I can't do them all at once, like right now, but I definitely am going to have a lot of the details in the videos. But this is the basic design that I started with, and I sent this to my engineer, and I said, can you make me up a set of plans? And finally, when I found the right guy, he was able to do it. Um, it still took like six months, though. So right now, I'm in the hole for $5,500 for these plans that I have and I also have another 3000 into my septic design so I'm 8500 in the hole already and I haven't even stepped foot on site yet so that's kind of that's kind of where I'm starting so like I said everything in this house is going to be concrete the only exception that might happen is I might make the stairs out of wood um, the first floor stairs and the second floor stairs. I might make that out of wood. I'm not sure. But everything else is going to be concrete. So the way that I'm going to do this is because you can see I have quite a bit of pitch here. This is not the right pitch displayed right here. It's a little bit different than that. It's actually going to be an 8 pitch for the main roof. So these parts right here are going to be an 8 pitch. This is only about a 4 pitch here. Um, so with an 8 pitch, that's going to be hard to pour. So you got to pour it with very low slump. So I'm going to need like a 2 inch slump on this. So I'm hoping that I can use my concrete bucket to achieve that 2 inch slump because a pump needs like a 6 inch slump. I could be wrong and I'm going to check into that, but I'm trying to use the concrete bucket as much as I can because each pour is $800. So let's see how many pours we got we're gonna have one for the footings we're gonna have one for the basement walls we're gonna have one for the first floor we're gonna have one for the second floor and then we're gonna have I'm gonna to try to do these at the same time as the other ones but then once we get to the roof we're gonna have a pour for the main part of the roof and this part of the roof too so that'll be one pour and then this will be another pour, probably with these gables here. That'll probably be another pour. So we got a bunch of different pours to do. So, so if you can imagine, that's $800 each pour for a pump truck. Whereas it's free if I can do it with the concrete bucket. So we'll see how that works out. So I decided to go with an all concrete house. Um, and actually, originally I was going to do all concrete with my Simons forms. But then I kind of got into the ICFs. So right now this works out extremely well as far as financially because concrete never went up, but obviously lumber did. Lumber went up a lot, like quadruple um, what it normally is. So, But even before lumber went up, this was actually still cheaper to build just because I'm going to be using mostly concrete for everything. The ICFs cost money. But I still figured it out to be a lot less. So there's not going to be any siding on the walls. It's just going to be stucco. There's not going to be any plywood or framing on the walls. And it already has its insulation, so that's done. So for the roof, the roof is going to be all concrete. It's going to be a 3-inch slab with some pour-in-place joists. 
and I'll get into that in a minute, but basically on the roof, it's just going to have paint, which is going to be a special kind of paint that's UV resistant and it's flexible and it seals up and stretches and it's, it's, I'll get into that later, but just know that I don't have any framing for the roof. I don't have any plywood for the roof. I don't have any roofing materials. Um, it's just very basic. You just pour the slab, you put the paint on, and you're done. So, on the inside, I'm pretty sure they're going to make me put some sort of 15 minute fire barrier, which could be sheetrock, and I think you can actually use a one by wood for that, and I may use some decorative wood in some places. Um, but, for the most part, the only wood that I'm going to be using is for the stairs, and possibly some panels on the walls just to make it more comfortable inside but other than that I'm not going to be framing out of any wood at all so so there's going to be a lot of work going into this roof to make this work the walls the foundation and stuff is going to be pretty easy but the roof is definitely going to take some work but I love the look of it so I wouldn't have it any other way one of the neatest things about this whole house is how I'm going to do the floor and the roof I'm going to be using a product called Build Deck and it's made by Build Block. And what it's going to do is give me a poured in place joist with an integral slab on the top, three inches. And basically, the void between these pieces is what makes your joist. It forms it. And so it's all a monolithic pour. You do it all at once. Pour the joist first and then you vibe that and then you come back after and you do the slab and you, so it's all done at once. When I saw this system for the first time, I was hooked. I thought this was the greatest thing ever. And I hope to see that it really blows up around here. Everybody's afraid to use concrete to build with, but I'm not. So this is what each piece looks like. Um, and on the bottom here, you, you can put a C channel and that way you can screw into it and put like sheetrock or whatever you wanna put up there you can use that C-channel for attachment points or you can use an adhesive on the bottom or even do something like a stucco which I may look into but it's got to be a 15 minute fire rating on it I'm also going to have this radiant heat just like this in each level and that way it's in every room and I can have different zones for every room I can power it with the geothermal system so this is kind of a cross section of what it looks like you got your stirrups here and you got two number fives in the bottom I'm going to be using a 12 inch build deck for the two floors and then I'm going to be using an 8 inch build deck for the roof and so the roof is going to be really kind of unique because you never really see that. Right now the engineer specced it out so I have these steel I-beams in here this is going to be the main ridge beam that goes through the whole building and then this is going to be a valley beam, a valley beam and then the ridge for the gable on the front. So I'm going to see if he can change that so that these are all pour in place beams instead because like this one right here is a W24 by 55 pounds which is a pretty substantial beam I think I priced it out at like two grand just for that beam so this beam right here is not that substantial but the valley beams those are W10 by 33 so those are a little bit heavier but basically but if I could get away with a poured beam, I'd just be pouring a couple yards of concrete instead of spending like $4,000 on beams. But that's not even the reason that I want to change it, actually. The reason is because steel buckles under a lot of heat. So if I had a fire, I wouldn't want my roof to collapse with steel beams because they would buckle before anything else. They would buckle even before wood does. So that's why I want to try to get a poured in place beam. Um, hopefully we can make it happen, but... You know, it might be possible that it might not happen, so we'll see. But this is kind of the beam layout right here. This is the main beam. This is the dormer gable beam and two valley beams. So you can see this steel beam is sticking way below everything else, too. So that's kind of another reason why I wanted to do it, because I wanted to use that area as like a chase area for utilities and stuff. So I kind of wanted that beam to be tucked up a little bit more. When we're running the build deck on top of a beam or in a pocket, we have to put what's called a shear stud. And that kind of sits right next to the rebar and gets welded onto the steel. So for a pocket, the shear stud goes down 
and then on the top is a plate that it's already you already pre-weld it and then stick it upside down in the pocket let it sit in the concrete so that the shear stud is in the concrete and then the top gets welded to the beam that rests on it and you can have some shims there too and everything gets welded together this is going to be 32 feet long and 24 feet wide so with the mudroom you're looking at about 800 square feet on the first floor and I don't know I think it was like 750 feet on the second floor so a lot of you guys are gonna say well that's really small but I can tell you that I live in a smaller house right now and I don't even use half the house so we don't need a lot of space inside the house and I already planned out for an addition on this side of the building so we're gonna come out with a gable here um, and that's going to be maybe a year or two down the road, but I have this all designed out so that basically you're going to take this window and you're going to demo saw it down to the floor and that's going to be your entrance to the addition. And um, it's nice if you can plan out ahead of time for an addition because right now I am actually doing this entire project out of pocket with no loan. So... I'm trying to keep on a very small tight budget and I'm trying to work as I go to get money to build more so that's going to be a, a big struggle in this whole thing um, is just getting the finances to keep going for the materials and working and having the time to do it at the same time so it's definitely going to be an adventure and I'll try to keep you guys in the loop as close as I can I think this will actually be really interesting for most people, even if you're not into construction. This is definitely different than you would normally see um, a normal house looking like because it kind of combines two different worlds into one, which is like a commercial world where the concrete comes from, um, but yet it's still residential because it's not like it's not like I have a flat roof on it. It's not like it looks like a, a hospital or an industrial building. It's going to look like a regular house when it's done. So it's going to be really homey feeling, but have the commercial type of structure to it. So concrete, obviously, is fireproof. It's windproof. It's rotproof. It's seismic proof. It's just everything proof. It's bulletproof. And I may consider bulletproof windows, too. But it's also like rodent proof, insect proof, it's mold proof, very tight. The structure is going to be so tight that I'm going to need some air exchangers in there. And it's also got a lot of thermal mass too. So concrete will heat up during the day and then it'll keep that heat in there during the night. And I already have a geothermal system that I'm going to be installing in here. And so that's going to make it even, even more efficient to live in here. So designing this house and finally getting to build it on this property has been a dream of mine for so long. It's been my dreams and goals and ambitions all in one. And basically I'm really glad that it's finally hitting the road here because it's been too long that I've been trying to get this going. And um, I'm just really glad to, to finally get going on it. So another detail that I don't really have in here is that I'm not going to have a bathroom on the first floor. And I know a lot of people think that's crazy, but I'm only going to have a bathroom on the second floor and in the basement. So I am going to be planning for a bathroom in the basement before I even um, pour my slab down there. i got to get all that plumbing situated. So I will have two bathrooms, just not one on the first floor. So this is definitely a little bit different and I know a lot of people are going to have opinions one way or the other about what I should and shouldn't do but I've thought about this for a long time and this is exactly what I want and the fact that I will not have any loan on it when I'm done um, that makes it even better so my plan is that my house right now that I'm living in currently is going to be sold but I need to get this foundation in and really I should get the first floor in before I can even think about selling my house because I can live in that garage at my property I can live above the garage on that second floor but I don't want to do that until I have at least like a third of the house done that way I don't have to worry about my living situation in that garage for a long time and I know things are progressing 
So once I can do that, then I can sell my house and I can get the rest of the money for this. But basically, I just need to come up with enough money to get going first. So like I said, I already have $8,500 into this house without even stepping foot on site. Um, I'm hoping to get the foundation and the first floor and the f first floor walls installed for about 30 grand. So it'll be 30 grand plus the 8,500. So I'm about, you know, a little under 40 grand to get started to the point where I can feel comfortable selling my house and living in that garage for a few months until I can finish the rest of it. Because I know I can't afford to do the whole house without selling my house first. And the house that I have right now, I have tons of equity in it. Um, I've only had one loan in my entire life and that was just to put an addition onto the house I'm living in right now. And so I only owe a little bit of money out of that. The rest is all equity. And I would take out an equity loan, but I just don't like loans. Loans are just ridiculously inefficient. They're, you just waste so much money. So I will do some videos about fixing up the house that I'm living in right now. The only thing I have to finish up is my kitchen and just a few miscellaneous things. And I'm doing something really cool for that. So I'll show you guys those videos uh, when I get the chance to work on it next. So like I said, I have a lot more details that I can share with you guys along the way, but I don't want to bore you guys all at once. So let's get going on the site work and let's, let's get rolling on this. So now that you guys know where I'm coming from, let's get going on this site work. I've already started setting stakes tentatively where I want the corners to be, but I really can't finalize that until all these trees are out of here. It's kind of hard to measure in between the trees and draw up straight lines and stuff. On this property, we don't have a crazy amount of trees. So I always try to choose wisely if I need to take down a tree, whether I really need to take it down or not. So what I'm thinking that we're gonna do here is these are the biggest trees right here. There's a pine tree right here and then another pine tree right there. And I'm gonna try to stop right there so I don't have to take those down. Those are gonna be pretty close to my new house. But being that the house is made out of all concrete, if they ever fell down, it's not gonna do anything to the house. But everything from there over to here needs to be cleared. Luckily, there's not a lot of big growth here. I think the biggest tree that I need to take out is this little cedar tree right here, which is like maybe 12 inches at the base. There's another one right there about that size too. The rest of it's all small growth, so I don't have to feel too bad about taking it out. I got the 130 here ready to go. It doesn't have a thumb on it yet, but we're going to do the best we can without it. And I'll probably lay all these trees down and then bring them over that way, cut them up.
all these trees are green, so they're not burning the easiest, but I got it. Plus, it's just super wet out. Got a pile of cedar branches there for mulch for the garden over there. My plan was to have my two dump trucks running back and forth between this house site here and over in that area there. And also I have another spot off the road that I want to do some work to my road and kind of change the, the layout of it. So I was going to have two dump trucks running doing that, but there is just nothing but mud here. And this is all mixed in with clay, so when it's wet, it's just unpassable. So my plans are kind of changed now. I could still have one dump truck up there running to the road, but at this point I'm thinking the best thing for me to do it's kind of hard to see, but I have my house all laid out here. We've had so much rain that everything is just getting washed away. So I think my plan now is going to be that I'm going to dig out for my foundation and put it all down here. And then I'm going to take it and push it with the dozer that way. And that way this will all dry out a lot quicker. Because this stuff here is nice and dry. And it's also a totally different kind of soil. This is nice and loose. There's not a lot of clay in it. It's actually a pretty decent soil for around here. So uh, my plan was already to use some for down there and then eventually put some down there and then it'll become all nice usable land here. So I'm gonna fly the drone up and show you guys what I have for my layout here. It's hard to see from down here. I'm gonna use some yellow paint here to show you but right now I'm in my walkout basement part I'm not doing a normal walkout basement where I have just a door coming off the side of the foundation I'm actually having like a chamber coming out like 10 feet and it's like 8 feet wide and then that will be my walkout basement and I'll have a door here and to keep the rest heated from there in so I'm gonna have step footings and they're gonna start here it's going to be four feet below everything else and then step up in three steps and then get to the regular foundation here. Which, again, I don't know if you can really see it that well. But let's fly the drone overhead and I'll show you what I'm talking about. All right, guys, so this is going to be the front of my house here. This is going to be an entrance way here. Kind of like a mud room. So that's going to have a full basement underneath of it. So then you're going to walk in and actually the door is going to be off to the left side because I need all that room over on the right side for the stairs. And that's actually kind of why I put that there because I was never able to center the door here. So the door will be centered there, but, but once you get inside the door will be over here. And then here's the stairs. It's going downstairs this way. Walk around here. There's a landing. goes upstairs. So in this space here, this is all my kitchen here. This is all my living room here. It's all open concept. There's going to be no beams or walls or anything like that. So then in the basement, like I said, this is going to be like the exit for the basement. And it's going to be like a little chamber here. So this is going to be open here, but then a door here. And originally I was going to have it over there, but I got to make a change to the engineer because I don't want it like impeding the flow of traffic over there. Traffic meaning like quads and dump trucks maybe or something. And then over here is going to be four feet below everything. So you can see the water table down there. That's, that's the water table I'm working with. So what I'm going to do is start my footings for the rest of the house at two feet above that area. And then basically um, this is going to be four feet below that. So this is going to be like two feet below the water table. So I'm going to use the excavator on the bottom first, get that all established. Once I got everything the way I want it down there, then I'll dig down for the footings, for the step footing down there that's deeper than everything else. I'm going to dig a pit beside of it so I can drain the water. And then once that's all done, 
I'll come up here and dig the rest of it from up here and load it out with dump trucks. But for today, I'm alone, so I'm not running any dump trucks. I'm just going to take what I can from over there, start putting it there, and work my way this way. So I'm not stepping the footings down until I get down to this chamber, and then that's going to be four feet below everything else. But the rest of the foundation is all going to be at one level. So I'm going to dig it all out flat and then put my drainage stone in there, number two. So this whole thing is just going to be one flat area when I'm done digging here. So what I've determined is that I want to be two feet above the water level of this pond. I got two feet above and that's going to be the bottom of my footings and then I'm coming up four inches with stone from there. And then I'll have my footings and then my slab. So my slab is essentially going to be like about three feet above the water level here. So I'll never ever see any water in my basement because the groundwater will never be that high. And I know that because I've talked to the neighbors around here and they said that even when Irene happened, this never got flooded here. The reason is because there's a stream that goes around that woods line behind there. And then that stream has a waterfall about 500 yards that way. And that waterfall drops like, I don't know, at least 20 feet. So there's no way that this area would ever flood because of that drop off over there. That waterfall over there, even if something blocked it along the way, along the stream, it could really never rise above like maybe a foot what it is now. Even if it was completely blocked by a dam or something, it would just go around the waterfall, around the sides of it. So it's never gonna flood around here. So I'm gonna dig this entire foundation two feet above that water level. So now I know that that pin represents the level that I need to dig this whole thing at. And I know that that's not going to change. So every day that I set up this laser level, I can calibrate it into that. And I can, as I'm working along, things are going to change. Like I'm going to need to know the top of the stone, the top of the footing, the top of the foundation. And all that can be calculated by just having that one calibration pin right there. And you don't really want it sticking out of the ground, especially if you got kids, because sometimes they don't pay attention and you know you can impale somebody pretty hard. Hopefully by the time I get some dirt stacked up, that pile will be all burnt down and I can just push it that way. So before I take the first scoop out of this foundation pit here, I want to tell you guys that this actually is the line that represents the house itself. So obviously I need to overdig that quite a bit. So I'm going to use my judgment as I'm going along because down here you don't really need to dig too far out because I'm not digging too far down. Up here I'll make it wider. So I'll use my judgment as I'm going along and I'll kind of figure that out. The problem is this soil is, is kind of unpredictable. Sometimes you could hit really loose stuff, sometimes you hit rocky stuff, sometimes you hit clay. You could hit that all on the same foundation here. So that's just kind of the way it goes around here. So ideally I'd like to just do a nice clean two feet of overdig, but in real life that doesn't really work around this area because that could be dangerous in some spots because then you'll have stuff that's too loose and it'll fall down. So then I'll have to step it. The trick is this excavator takes a big scoop at once. I'd say if you heap that bucket up, it's like a yard and a half in one shot. So overdigging is not really a problem. It's just like an, an extra few minutes of digging, that's it. I have plans to make a rock screener, so I'll fill it in with the stuff that doesn't have the rocks in it when I'm done. But for right now, there's no reason why I can't overdig it by quite a bit and then taper it down. Like over here, I don't want just like a, an abrupt cliff right here where it ends, because this is gonna be eight feet down. But you know, I got kids and animals and stuff around here. I don't want people falling down that. So what I'm gonna do is taper it down that way so that the most drop you're gonna see is probably like two or three feet. 
and then everything else will be tapered down. Okay, so I'm ready to start digging. So I'm just gonna get right down to that level and start working it around.
All right, guys, so I have less than an hour into it, and I would say I have approximately a third of the basement done. It's pretty important to, to keep your level as you're going along. You don't want to just start digging away and like over dig it too much. I'm used to my mini excavator and even smaller machines and backhoes and stuff. This is just like ridiculously quicker. Like it's, it's not even comparable. It would take me several days to dig this out with the mini excavator and it has no reach. So you got to figure out where to put the dirt because it keeps getting in your way. With this, I just have this pile over here and I'll have another, I guess two piles just like it. And I'll dig from up there and that way I'm scooping that way. And um, I'll probably load it out with some trucks. Maybe, maybe I can spread this out with the dozer and get it drivable with the trucks. And then I can just back the truck right into there and load it up. That's what's nice about a walkout basement type of basement like this is that this whole end is all going to be flat. So I can come in here with the dozer or a skid steer or whatever I want and I can access it. It's not just a big hole in the ground because this, this end of it is at ground level. So that's, that's always a lot easier than having to just punch a straight hole in the ground. So that pile is almost burnt up. By tomorrow, I'll be able to doze this all off. Doze that over to here. Just get this whole area nice. Because I was hoping to have the concrete truck be able to drive back here. This is the next day and it's much drier out, sun's out. So what I'm gonna do is bring the excavator up here. I got my dump truck right there. I'm gonna pull this back, kind of step it down. I'm not gonna dig all the way, just maybe halfway, just to kind of get some of this stuff out of here and bring it over there. The reason I'm doing that is because otherwise when I'm digging at this, I'm gonna mess up what I already have there. And I can't really see well enough to dig down deep enough to just keep digging the full depth. So that's why I'm gonna step this back and then come back at it again and then dig the proper depth.
This is the area where I was dumping all this dirt. This particular area is going to be for the dirt that I'm going to use for backfill. So I'm actually ending up with three spots that I need it. One will be right next to the site, you know, by the pond over there. And then there'll be another up by the road. But this is getting kind of scattered out here because I keep getting stuck. So I'm not getting the dirt exactly where I want it. So I'm gonna use the excavator and clump all this together into one big pile. And then I'm gonna use some of this to actually put on the ground so I don't keep getting stuck.
So all I'm going to do is put the dump truck right where that excavator is right now, load it up from the top. My excavator will be up there. And we'll just bring the dump truck around. And I'm going to use it for this field here. This is actually pretty nice topsoil. The stuff I have on here is all clay. So I put a foot of this on here and now this will grow grass. That's exactly what I wanted too. I was hoping this would be some good soil here because I could really use that out here because it's all just clay and mush. And it doesn't grow grass that well. So this will be this will be a huge welcome here. So the only problem we're gonna have is there's a couple spots that are still a little bit mucky, like right there. All right, let me go get him unstuck. Doing some final touches to the, to the floor here. It's nothing but rock on the bottom, so it's really hard to get a nice flat surface on the bottom. I'm pretty sure it's all dug out the way it needs to be. They're just kind of feathering it out. It 
So that whole corner there, we brought over and put right there. So I'm gonna use some of it. There's a lot of rocks in it, so it makes a good road. It's kind of like four inch minus. So I'm gonna take it and put some of it over there because this is where I want the concrete truck to come around. And then I'll use the rest of this over here. Bring it up about a foot. You can see there's still a lot of water here. But as soon as you put this stuff on, it soaks up the water and then the sun hits it and it dries right out. And then the rain goes right through this stuff. This is like good drainable soil. It poured for a few days on that site over there. And when I came back, there was no water on it. It wasn't, it didn't even look like anything happened. So the water drained right through it. Probably perks good too. These piles being stacked up like this is kind of hard on the dozer. If I had like a D8, you could probably just come over and just plow them down, but this one will do it. It's just not efficient to do that. So I'll bring the excavator over here, spread it out to about two to three feet piles, and then I'll uh, doze it all off.
we've been having really bad luck with rain lately. I don't know why. I got this pretty well laid out now. I got the corners marked out anyways. Just for the main building. I haven't done the uh, the two jog outs from it. But I did square it up using a 345 method. I did a 15, 20, and 25 foot. What I'm gonna do now, just to make sure this is the position that I want it, I'm gonna take my drone and fly it up and kind of look around the property and make sure that it looks right from the sky. Cause it could have changed a little bit from when we were doing all this work. It's hard to keep track of exactly where. I mean, you could do something like a well-known point from trees you, if you triangulate it you could get those marks again, but I was never set in stone with them to begin with, so I didn't even bother doing that. But if you had like tight setbacks and you were trying to make sure that you were definitely within those setbacks, you definitely could do a, a reference point using a triangle from trees and stuff, or just pins that you place outside of the foundation. But again, I didn't do that because I wasn't even sure if the first um, marking that I had was right. So let's put the drone in the sky and see how this looks. All right, so there's the layout. There's me standing there. Let's just go up and see what it looks like. I kind of do have some tight spots because I don't want to be too close to that swimming pond and I don't want to be too close to the pond that has the island on it. And I also don't want to be too close to the pine trees. So, probably a good 30 feet away from the swimming pond probably a good 35 40 feet away from the jet ski pond and then on the right side i guess i guess you could call that about 25 feet i think that's the best i'm gonna get it it looks pretty good to me so we're gonna go with that you could spend a lot of time moving the house around a foot here and a foot there and at the end of the day you really won't even know unless something's really obvious you won't even really know that it's not the way you want it or it is the way you want it until it's totally built and you got everything landscaped and everything there's a lot of factors to put into a house so there's a lot of things to think about and sometimes you just have to kind of go with things do it the best you can let's just give this one more overview here I'm pretty happy with that. It's a little bit close to that swimming pond, but I don't want it any closer to the pine trees, even though I probably will take them out eventually. But I think I'm gonna go with this. All right, so I'm gonna get this all marked out and we're gonna put some gravel in here, level it all out, and then we can tamp it down. Compact it. So I put this gravel here just so the guys have something to do in the morning while I'm digging out for the rest of this. I'm gonna have them bring in a skid steer and level this out with the laser level, tamp it out. And then I'll get going on the entrance way, the mud room there. And then also the step footings back there need to be dug down deeper.
I had to give up on this site for a few days because we had nothing but torrential downpours. We got more rain in the last couple days than we have in the whole last year. So it's just starting to dry out now. So what I got to do is just dig for those step footings in that chamber over there. And I got to add a little bit more gravel here. I'm just trying to drain some of this water out of here so I can see where I'm at. So the first thing I'm going to do is come out two feet with the same level that I'm already at. And then I'm going to step it down 16 inches and then go another two feet and then step it down another 16 inches and then go the rest of the way and that'll be four feet. Because the ICFs are 16 inches tall so you want to do them in increments of 16. So it's really hard to step down a foundation when the soil is like this because it goes from nothing but loose rocks to clay to silty kind of 
dirt and then loose stuff. It's got all kinds of stuff mixed in one. So it's really hard to keep like a nice clean shelf. So we're just gonna use some extra gravel. We're gonna do some extra camping. And I dug it down deeper there so I could put a sump pit in there, just a temporary one to keep the water out while we're pouring this and forming it. But I got the main area dug out now, so now I can take my small excavator and kind of clean it up a little bit. And then the rest is by hand. So after digging this hole, I got all this fill right here that I'm gonna spread out in this field again. spread it all out that way. Yesterday I dug out for this step footing area here for the chamber in the back. And you can see the water is just really high in here already, oh, just from like 12 hours. So I got a sump pit basin here. I'm gonna just drill out 3 16 holes in it, stick it down in there, stick a sump pump in there and get all this water out. And then I'm gonna keep it on there with a float until the project's done to the point where I can backfill it. There's just always gonna be groundwater in here. So there's no, there's no point in running footing drains because there's nowhere to daylight it to. And 
a sump pit to get down to that level would be like four feet below the top of the slab. So that's not reasonable to do. So the footings are just gonna always see water, but there's nothing I can do about it. All right, guys, so this rain doesn't appear to be letting up any time in the next week or two. So I'm just going to continue on, try to get this little bit of site work done that I have left here. So I got to just fill in that corner there with some number two stone. Um, it's going to need some more tamping. And then I've been using Crusher Run for this. So that's the last step right there, and there'll be a foundation going across there. And there will be a door just above that, but I still need to cross there with the foundation. And then I'm going to put Crusher Run on all of this because Crusher Run holds up vertically a lot better than number two stone does. So if you put number two stone on the part in between the two steps, it'll just fall down to the bottom. Whereas Crusher Run will kind of pack into there so we can get the whole thing covered in Crusher Run. So there's a lot of silt that kind of like drained out from up here into there so i'm going to scoop that off one more time with a flat shovel just get all that silt out of there and then put some more crusher run on 
and then get that compacted down to the right level. Ideally, this is something where a jumping jack would actually work pretty good, but I don't have one. I just have a regular tamper, so I'll just be tamping it by hand. This drain is working pretty good here, so we'll just keep that in there until it's done. So the first thing I'm going to do is mark this back out again between these two stakes here. I'll start measuring what I need, and then I can put the stone right where I need it, get it right to the level that I need, the height, and then we'll tamp it out, and we'll be done with the site work for now.
I just drew those lines real quick. They're not the actual dimensions of it. It exaggerates it just a little bit just to make sure that the excavation is where it needs to be. But the site work here is done as much as I can. I would have liked to do a lot more cleaning up and just a lot more stuff to make this site dry and and a lot more accessible but the weather has not been cooperating so this is what I'm working with I did get a good foot on that entire area over there so that was a, a good bonus and I also got some dirt moved in other places that really helped me out a lot and I have a lot of dirt left for backfill it's just not here because it would be in the way there's not a lot of room here the footing size for this house is 12 inches deep and 27 inches wide. Just so you guys have an idea of why this is all flat and I didn't dig down for the footings, it's because I like to actually have a flat work surface. It makes the excavation a lot easier. It makes tamping the gravel a lot easier. It just makes a lot of things more streamlined when you just lay a flat pad like this. So what I'm gonna do is put the top of the slab four inches below the top of the footing and there's a bunch of reasons why I'm going to do that, but I'll get into that later. So I got this all laid out here. This is actually a little bit bigger than I need. I just need to do some more compacting in here. So once it stops raining and before we set the footings, I will run that tamper another two times at least. So those step footings are pretty good to go for now. I would have liked to have got them shaped better, but there's a lot of rock in there. So we got the first step, second step, third step, and there's going to be a wall across there. And then that's going to be my door right there. That way I can fill it only up to the ground level. So I wasn't too worried about the middle right here because my footings are going to be from there to there, 27 inches. And then from there to there, 27 inches. And then in the middle here, I'm just going to put a bunch of gravel and bring it right up to the same level as this other slab here. That way it's all one continuous slab out, but the footings drop down so that I have four feet of cover over the footings from the outside. Because that whole face of that side is going to be at ground level. So at that level, you need to be four feet below that for the frost level. I'm going to try to make the videos following this one a little bit shorter. This one's definitely a little bit longer because it's kind of two things in one. It's the intro to the house as well as some site work. The next video will be about the footings and I'm using Forma Drain for that. And then immediately after the footings are poured, I'm actually gonna do the slab in here and I'm gonna be doing radiant heat in that. So that'll be the third video. And I'll take you guys one step at a time through this house. There is a lot to go over on the plans as far as the rebar schedule and just different various things that are involved in this. So we'll break it down one step at a time and we'll get through this together. So I'll see you guys in the next video.